a river adventure down the Danube turns dark when an eerie presence is felt in the willows. Algernon Blackwood, today on the Classic Tales podcast. Welcome to the Classic Tales podcast. Thank you for listening. Thank you to all of our financial supporters. We couldn't do this without you. We really try to make your support worth your while. For a $5 monthly donation, you get a monthly coupon code for $8 off any audiobook download. Give more and you get more. It kind of cracks open the website for you, so you can easily build out your classic audiobook library and you help to give more folks like you the chance to discover the classics in a curated and easily accessible format. Go to ClassicTalesAudiobooks.com today and become a financial supporter. You'll be glad you did. Thank you so much. I'm pleased to announce that the audiobook of The Hollow Needle and the complete audiobook The Confessions of Arsène Lupin are now available for purchase at the website. If you're wanting to add these to your audiobook collection and listen to them all in one go, now you can. The Classic Tales app is a great little tool for listening to the podcast. You can easily follow the links in the show notes and you can see the episode-specific artwork that I create for every title. You also can hear the occasional special feature. This app doesn't interact with the website, though, just a fair warning. I've looked into it, and to create such an app is cost-prohibitive at this point. But, if you want a quick place to jump and get your Classic Tales fix, the Classic Tales app is a great place to go. This last week, we were having a barbecue dinner on Sunday, and Seven and Goldie were shucking the corn. They had two chairs set up and were watching YouTube videos and talking and just enjoying being together. And I just had a moment where I remembered when the kids were young and they really fought a lot. And we really wanted our kids to be good friends when they were older, to enjoy each other's company, to be buddies. And it seemed like an impossible dream when they were little. But now, here we are. We kind of made it. It really, really made me happy just to see my two little ones enjoying their time together. It was a sweet little moment. And now for something completely different. H.P. Lovecraft, who coined the term weird fiction, considered today's story, The Willows, to be the finest supernatural tale in English literature. You can see how it would appeal to him, the masterful way that Blackwood personifies the willows to be ominous, alive, and menacing. The human natures attributed to the river and the omniscient power of the wind all build to create a very Lovecraftian atmosphere that begs the question of whether there is an ancient supernatural force guiding it all. Let's see how it all shakes out. And now, The Willows, Part 1 of 2, by Algernon Blackwood. Chapter 1 after leaving Vienna, and long before you come to Budapest, the Danube enters a region of singular loneliness and desolation, where its waters spread away on all sides, regardless of a main channel, and the country becomes a swamp for miles upon miles, covered by a vast sea of low willow bushes. On the big maps, this deserted area is painted in a fluffy blue, growing fainter in color as it leaves the banks, and across it may be seen in large, straggling letters the word Sumpfe, meaning marshes. In high flood, this great acreage of sand, shingle beds, and willow-grown islands is almost topped by the water. But in normal seasons, the bushes bend and rustle in the free winds, showing their silver leaves to the sunshine in an ever-moving plain of bewildering beauty. These willows never attain to the dignity of trees, 
They have no rigid trunks. They remain humble bushes, with rounded tops and soft outline, swaying on slender stems that answer to the least pressure of the wind, supple as grasses, and so continually shifting that they somehow give the impression that the entire plain is moving and alive. For the wind sends waves rising and falling over the whole surface, waves of leaves instead of waves of water, green swells like the sea too, until the branches turn and lift, and then silvery white as their underside turns to the sun. Happy to slip beyond the control of the stern banks, the Danube here wanders about at will among the intricate network of channels intersecting the islands everywhere with broad avenues down which the waters pour with a shouting sound, making whirlpools, eddies, and foaming rapids, tearing at the sandy banks, carrying away masses of shore and willow clumps, and forming new islands innumerably, which shift daily in size and shape, and possess at best an impermanent life since the flood time obliterates their very existence. Properly speaking, this fascinating part of the river's life begins soon after leaving Pressburg, and we, in our Canadian canoe, with gypsy tent and frying pan on board, reached it on the crest of a rising flood about mid-July. That very same morning, when the sky was reddening before sunrise, we had slipped swiftly through still-sleeping Vienna, leaving it a couple of hours later a mere patch of smoke against the blue hills of the Wienerwald on the horizon. We had breakfasted below Fishermend, under a grove of birch trees roaring in the wind, and had then swept on the tearing current past Ort, Einburg, Petronell, the old Roman Carnuntum of Marcus Aurelius, and so under the frowning heights of Thelsen, on a spur of the Carpathians, where the march steals in quietly from the left, and the frontier is crossed between Austria and Hungary. Racing along at twelve kilometers an hour soon took us well into Hungary, and the muddy waters, sure sign of flood, sent us aground on many a shingle bed, and twisted us like a cork in many a sudden belching whirlpool before the towers of Pressburg, Hungarian Posogne, showed against the sky. And then the canoe, leaping like a spirited horse, flew at top speed under the grey walls, negotiated safely the sunken chain of the Fliegende Brook ferry, turned the corner sharply to the left, and plunged on yellow foam into the wilderness of islands, sandbanks, and swampland beyond, the land of the willows. The change came suddenly, as when a series of bioscope pictures snaps down on the streets of a town and shifts, without warning, into the scenery of lake and forest. We entered the land of desolation on wings, and in less than half an hour there was neither boat, nor fishing hut, nor red roof, nor any single sign of human habitation and civilization within sight. The sense of remoteness from the world of humankind, the utter isolation, the fascination of this singular world of willows, winds, and waters, instantly laid its spell upon us both, so that we allowed laughingly to one another that we ought by rights to have held some special kind of passport to admit us, and that we had, somewhat audaciously, come without asking leave into a separate little kingdom of wonder and magic, a kingdom that was reserved for the use of others who had a right to it, with everywhere unwritten warnings to trespassers for those who had the imagination to discover them. Though still early in the afternoon, the ceaseless buffetings of a most tempestuous wind made us feel weary, and we at once began casting about for a suitable camping ground for the night but the bewildering character of the islands made landing difficult. The swirling flood carried us inshore and then swept us out again. The willow branches tore our hands as we seized them to stop the canoe, 
and we pulled many a yard of sandy bank into the water, before at length we shot with a great sideways blow from the wind into a backwater, and managed to beach the bows in a cloud of spray. Then we lay panting and laughing after our exertions on the hot yellow sand, sheltered from the wind, and in the full blaze of a scorching sun, a cloudless blue sky above, and an immense army of dancing, shouting willow bushes, closing in from all sides, shining with spray and clapping their thousand little hands as though to applaud the success of our efforts. What a river! I said to my companion, thinking of all the way we had traveled from the source in the Black Forest, and how he had often been obliged to wade and push in the upper shallows at the beginning of June. Won't stand much nonsense now, will it? he said, pulling the canoe a little farther into safety up the sand, and then composing himself for a nap. I lay by his side, happy and peaceful, in the bath of the elements, water, wind, sand, and the great fire of the sun, thinking of the long journey that lay behind us, and of the great stretch before us to the Black Sea, and how lucky I was to have such a delightful and charming traveling companion as my friend the Swede. We had made many similar journeys together, but the Danube, more than any other river I knew, impressed us from the very beginning with its aliveness. From its tiny bubbling entry into the world among the pinewood gardens of Donaueschingen, until this moment when it began to play the great river game of losing itself among the deserted swamps, unobserved, unrestrained, it had seemed to us like following the growth of some living creature. Sleepy at first, but later developing violent desires as it became conscious of its deep soul. It rolled, like some huge fluid being, through all the countries we had passed, holding our little craft on its mighty shoulders, playing roughly with us sometimes, yet always friendly and well-meaning, till at length we had come inevitably to regard it as a great personage. How indeed could it be otherwise, since it told us so much of its secret life? At night, we heard it singing to the moon as we lay in our tent, uttering that odd, sibilant note peculiar to itself, and said to be caused by the rapid tearing of the pebbles along its bed. So great is its hurrying speed. We knew, too, the voice of its gurgling whirlpools, suddenly bubbling up on a surface previously quite calm, the roar of its shallows and swift rapids, its constant steady thundering below all mere surface sounds, and that ceaseless tearing of its icy waters at the banks. How it stood up and shouted when the rains fell flat upon its face, and how its laughter roared out when the wind blew upstream and tried to stop its growing speed. We knew all its sounds and voices, its tumblings and foamings, its unnecessary splashing against the bridges, that self-conscious chatter when there were hills to look on, the affected dignity of its speech when it passed through the little towns, far too important to laugh, and all these faint, sweet whisperings when the sun caught it fairly in some slow curve and poured down upon it till the steam rose. It was full of tricks, too, in its early life, before the great world knew it. There were places in the upper reaches among the Swabian forests, when yet the first whispers of its destiny had not reached it, where it elected to disappear through holes in the ground, to appear again on the other side of the porous limestone hills and start a new river with another name, leaving, too, so little water in its own bed that we had to climb out and wade and push the canoe through miles of shallows. And a chief pleasure, in those early days of its irresponsible youth, was to lie low, like Br'er Fox, just before the little turbulent tributaries came to join it from the Alps, and to refuse to acknowledge them when in, but to run for miles side by side, the dividing line well marked, 
the very levels different, the Danube utterly declining to recognize the newcomer. Below Passau, however, it gave up this particular trick, for there the in comes in, with a thundering power impossible to ignore, and so pushes and incommodes the parent river that there is hardly room for them in the long twisting gorge that follows, and the Danube is shoved this way and that against the cliffs, and forced to hurry itself with great waves and much dashing to and fro in order to get through in time. And during the fight our canoe slipped down from its shoulder to its breast, and had the time of its life among the struggling waves. But the inn taught the old river a lesson, and after Passau it no longer pretended to ignore new arrivals. This was many days back, of course, and since then we had come to know other aspects of the great creature, and across the Bavarian wheat plain of Straubing she wandered so slowly under the blazing June sun that we could well imagine only the surface inches were water, while below there moved, concealed as by a silken mantle, a whole army of undines, passing silently and unseen down to the sea, and very leisurely too, lest they be discovered. Much too we forgave her because of her friendliness to the birds and animals that haunted the shores. Cormorants lined the banks in lonely places in rows, like short black palings. Grey crows crowded the shingle bats. Storks stood fishing in the vistas of shallower water that opened up between the islands. And hawks, swans, and marsh birds of all sorts filled the air with glinting wings and singing petulant cries. It was impossible to feel annoyed with the river's vagaries after seeing a deer leap with a splash into the water at sunrise and swim past the bows of the canoe. And often we saw fawns peering at us from the underbrush or looked straight into the brown eyes of a stag as we charged full tilt round a corner and entered another reach of the river. Foxes, too, everywhere haunted the banks, tripping daintily among the driftwood and disappearing so suddenly that it was impossible to see how they managed it. But now, after leaving Pressburg, everything changed a little, and the Danube became more serious. It ceased trifling. It was halfway to the Black Sea, within seeming distance almost of other stranger countries, where no tricks would be permitted or understood. It became suddenly grown up, and claimed our respect and even our awe. It broke out into three arms, for one thing, that only met again a hundred kilometers farther down, and for a canoe there were no indications which one was intended to be followed. If you take a side channel, said the Hungarian officer we met in the Pressburg shop while buying provisions, you may find yourselves when the flood subsides forty miles from anywhere, high and dry and you may easily starve. There are no people, no farms, no fishermen. I warn you not to continue. The river, too, is still rising, and this wind will increase. The rising river did not alarm us in the least, but the matter of being left high and dry by a sudden subsistence of the waters might be serious, and we had consequently laid in an extra stock of provisions. For the rest, the officer's prophecy held true, and the wind, blowing down a perfectly clear sky, increased steadily till it reached the dignity of a westerly gale. It was earlier than usual when we camped, for the sun was a good hour or two from the horizon, and leaving my friend still asleep on the hot sand, I wandered about in desultory examination of our hotel. The island I found was less than an acre in extent, a mere sandy bank standing some two or three feet above the level of the river. The far end, pointing into the sunset, was covered with flying spray, which the tremendous wind drove off the crests of the broken waves. It was triangular in shape, 
with the apex upstream. I stood there for several minutes, watching the impetuous crimson flood bearing down with a shouting roar, dashing in waves against the bank, as though to sweep it bodily away, and then swirling by in two foaming streams on either side. The ground seemed to shake with the shock and rush, while the furious movement of the willow bushes, as the wind poured over them, increased the curious illusion that the island itself actually moved. Above, for a mile or two, I could see the great river descending upon me. It was like looking up the slope of a sliding hill, white with foam, and leaping up everywhere to show itself to the sun. The rest of the island was too thickly grown with willows to make walking pleasant, but I made the tour nevertheless. From the lower end, the light of course changed, and the river looked dark and angry. Only the backs of the flying waves were visible, streaked with foam, and pushed forcibly by the great puffs of wind that fell upon them from behind. For a short mile it was visible, pouring in and out among the islands, and then disappearing with a huge sweep into the willows, which closed about it like a herd of monstrous antediluvian creatures crowding down to drink. They made me think of gigantic, sponge-like growths that sucked the river up into themselves. They caused it to vanish from sight. They herded there together in such overpowering numbers. Altogether it was an impressive scene, with its utter loneliness, its bizarre suggestion. And as I gazed, long and curiously, a singular emotion began to stir somewhere in the depths of me. Midway in my delight of the wild beauty, there crept, unbidden and unexplained, a curious feeling of disquietude, almost of alarm. A rising river, perhaps, always suggests something of the ominous, Many of the little islands I saw before me would probably have been swept away by the morning. This resistless, thundering flood of water touched the sense of awe. Yet I was aware that my uneasiness lay deeper far than the emotions of awe and wonder. It was not that I felt. Nor had it directly to do with the power of the driving wind, this shouting hurricane that might almost carry up a few acres of willows into the air and scatter them like so much chaff over the landscape. The wind was simply enjoying itself, for nothing rose out of the flat landscape to stop it, and I was conscious of sharing its great game with a kind of pleasurable excitement. Yet this novel emotion had nothing to do with the wind. Indeed, so vague was the sense of distress I experienced that it was impossible to trace it to its source and deal with it accordingly. Though I was aware, somehow, that it had to do with my realization of our utter insignificance before this unrestrained power of the elements about me. The huge grown river had something to do with it, too. A vague, unpleasant idea that we had somehow trifled with these great elemental forces in whose power we lay helpless every hour of the day and night. For here indeed they were gigantically at play together, and the sight appealed to the imagination. But my emotion, so far as I could understand it, seemed to attach itself more particularly to the willow bushes, to these acres and acres of willows, crowding, so thickly growing there, swarming everywhere the eye could reach, pressing upon the river as though to suffocate it, standing in dense array mile after mile beneath the sky, watching, waiting, listening. And apart quite from the elements, the willows connected themselves subtly with my malaise, attacking the mind insidiously somehow, by reason of their vast numbers, and contriving in some way or other to represent to the imagination a new and mighty power. A power, moreover, not altogether friendly.
to us. Great revelations of nature, of course, never fail to impress in one way or another, and I was no stranger to moods of the kind. Mountains overawe, and oceans terrify, while the mystery of great forests exercises a spell peculiarly its own. But all these, at one point or another, somewhere link on intimately with human life and human experience. They stir comprehensible, even if alarming, emotions. They tend on the whole to exalt. With this multitude of willows, however, it was something far different, I felt. Some essence emanated from them that besieged the heart. A sense of awe awakened, true, but of awe touched somewhere by a vague terror. Their serried ranks, growing everywhere darker about me as the shadows deepened, moving furiously, yet softly, in the wind, woke in me the curious and unwelcome suggestion that we had trespassed here upon the borders of an alien world, a world where we were intruders, a world where we were not wanted or invited to remain, where we ran grave risks, perhaps. The feeling, however, though it refused to yield its meaning entirely to analysis, did not at the time trouble me by passing into menace. Yet it never left me quite. Even during the very practical business of putting up the tent in a hurricane of wind and building a fire for the stew pot, it remained just enough to bother and perplex and to rob a most delightful camping ground of a good portion of its charm. To my companion, however, I said nothing, for he was a man I considered devoid of imagination. In the first place, I could never have explained to him what I meant, and in the second, he would have laughed stupidly at me if I had. There was a slight depression in the center of the island, and here we pitched the tent. The surrounding willows broke the wind a bit. A poor camp, observed the imperturbable Swede when at last the tent stood upright. No stones and precious little firewood. I'm for moving on early tomorrow, eh? This sand won't hold anything. But the experience of a collapsing tent at midnight had taught us many devices, and we made the cozy gypsy house as safe as possible, and then set about collecting a store of wood to last till bedtime. Willow bushes dropped no branches, and driftwood was our only source of supply. We hunted the shores pretty thoroughly. Everywhere the banks were crumbling as the rising flood tore at them and carried away great portions with a splash and a gurgle. The island's much smaller than when we landed, said the accurate Swede. It won't last long at this rate. We'd better drag the canoe close to the tent and be ready to start at a moment's notice. I shall sleep in my clothes. He was a little distance off, climbing along the bank, and I heard his rather jolly laugh as he spoke. By Jove! I heard him call a moment later, and turned to see what had caused his exclamation. But for the moment he was hidden by the willows and I could not find him. What in the world's this? I heard him cry again, and this time his voice had become serious. I ran up quickly and joined him on the bank. He was looking over the river, pointing at something in the water. Good heavens! It's a man's body! He cried excitedly. Look! A black thing, turning over and over in the foaming waves, swept rapidly past. It kept disappearing and coming up to the surface again. It was about twenty feet from the shore, and just as it was opposite to where we stood it lurched round and looked straight at us. We saw its eyes reflecting the sunset and gleaming in odd yellow as the body turned over. Then it gave a swift, gulping plunge and dived out of sight in a flash. An otter, by gad! we exclaimed in the same breath, laughing. It was an otter, alive and out on the hunt.
yet it had looked exactly like the body of a drowned man turning helplessly in the current. Far below, it came to the surface once again, and we saw its black skin, wet and shining in the sunlight. Then, too, just as we turned back, our arms full of driftwood, another thing happened to recall us to the river bank. This time it really was a man, and what was more, a man in a boat. Now a small boat on the Danube was an unusual sight at any time, but here, in this deserted region, and at flood time, it was so unexpected as to constitute a real event. We stood and stared. Whether it was due to the slanting sunlight, or the refraction from the wonderfully illumined water, I cannot say. But whatever the cause, I found it difficult to focus my sight properly upon the flying apparition. It seemed, however, to be a man, standing upright in a sort of flat-bottomed boat, steering with a long oar, and being carried down the opposite shore at a tremendous pace. He apparently was looking across in our direction, but the distance was too great, and the light too uncertain for us to make out very plainly what he was about. It seemed to me that he was gesticulating and making signs at us. His voice came across the water to us, shouting something furiously. But the wind drowned it, so that no single word was audible. There was something curious about the whole appearance, man, boat, signs, voice, that made an impression on me out of all proportion to its cause. He's crossing himself, I cried. Look, he's making the sign of the cross. I believe you're right, the Swede said, shading his eyes with his hand and watching the man out of sight. He seemed to be gone in a moment, melting away down there into the sea of willows where the sun caught them in the bend of the river and turned them into a great crimson wall of beauty. Mist, too, had begun to rise, so that the air was hazy. But what in the world is he doing at nightfall on this flooded river? I said half to myself. Where is he going at such a time? And what did he mean by his signs and shouting? Do you think he wished to warn us about something? He saw our smoke, and thought we were spirits, probably, laughed my companion. These Hungarians believe in all sorts of rubbish. You remember the shopwoman at Pressburg, warning us that no one ever landed here because it belonged to some sort of beings outside man's world? I suppose they believe in fairies and elementals, possibly demons too. That peasant in the boat saw people on the islands for the first time in his life, he added, after a slight pause. And it scared him, that's all. The Swede's tone of voice was not convincing, and his manner lacked something that was usually there. I noted the change instantly while he talked, though without being able to label it precisely. If they had enough imagination, I laughed loudly. I remember trying to make as much noise as I could. They might well people a place like this with the old gods of antiquity. The Romans must have haunted all this region, more or less, with their shrines and sacred groves and elemental deities. The subject dropped, and we returned to our stew pot, for my friend was not given to imaginative conversation as a rule. Moreover, just then I remember feeling distinctly glad that he was not imaginative. His stolid, practical nature suddenly seemed to me welcome and comforting. It was an admirable temperament, I felt. He could steer down rapids like a red Indian, shoot dangerous bridges and whirlpools better than any white man I ever saw in a canoe. He was a grand fellow for an adventurous trip, a tower of strength when untoward things happened. I looked at his strong face and light curly hair as he staggered along under his pile of driftwood, twice the size of mine, and I experienced a feeling of relief. Yes, I was distinctly glad just then that the Swede was what he was, and that he never made remarks that suggested more than they said. The river's still rising, though, he added. 
as if following out some thoughts of his own, and dropping his load with a gasp. This island will be under water in two days if it goes on. I wish the wind would go down, I said. I don't care a fig for the river. The flood, indeed, had no terrors for us. We could get off at ten minutes' notice, and the more water, the better we liked it. It meant an increasing current, and the obliteration of the treacherous shingle beds that so often threatened to tear the bottom out of our canoe. Contrary to our expectations, the wind did not go down with the sun. It seemed to increase with the darkness, howling overhead and shaking the willows round us like straws. Curious sounds accompanied it sometimes, like the explosion of heavy guns, and it fell upon the water and the island in great flat blows of immense power. It made me think of the sounds a planet must make, could we only hear it, driving along through space. But the sky kept wholly clear of clouds, and soon after supper the full moon rose up in the east and covered the river and the plain of shouting willows with a light like the day. We lay on the sandy patch beside the fire, smoking, listening to the noises of the night round us, and talking happily of the journey we had already made, and of our plans ahead. The map lay spread in the door of the tent, but the high wind made it hard to study, and presently we lowered the curtain and extinguished the lantern. The firelight was enough to smoke and see each other's faces by, and the sparks flew about overhead like fireworks. A few yards beyond, the river gurgled and hissed, and from time to time a heavy splash announced the falling away of further portions of the bank. Our talk, I noticed, had to do with the faraway scenes and incidents of our first camps in the Black Forest or of other subjects altogether remote from the present setting, for neither of us spoke of the actual moment more than was necessary, almost as though we had agreed tacitly to avoid discussion of the camp and its incidents. Neither the otter nor the boatman, for instance, received the honor of a single mention, though ordinarily these would have furnished discussion for the greater part of the evening. They were, of course, distinct events in such a place. The scarcity of wood made it a business to keep the fire going, for the wind, that drove the smoke in our faces wherever we sat, helped at the same time to make a forced draft. We took it in turn to make some foraging expeditions into the darkness, and the quantity the Swede brought back always made me feel that he took an absurdly long time finding it. For the fact was, I did not care much about being left alone, and yet it always seemed to be my turn to grub about among the bushes or scramble along the slippery banks in the moonlight. The long day's battle with wind and water, such wind and such water, had tired us both, and an early bed was the obvious program. Yet neither of us made the move for the tent. We lay there, tending the fire, talking in desultory fashion, peering about us into the dense willow bushes and listening to the thunder of wind and river. The loneliness of the place had entered our very bones, and silence seemed natural, for after a bit the sound of our voices became a trifle unreal and forced. Whispering would have been the fitting mode of communication, I felt, and the human voice, always rather absurd amid the roar of the elements, now carried with it something almost illegitimate. It was like talking out loud in church or in some place where it was not lawful, perhaps not quite safe to be overheard. The eeriness of this lonely island, set among a million willows, swept by a hurricane and surrounded by hurrying deep waters, touched us both, I fancy. Untrodden by a man, almost unknown to man, it lay there beneath the moon, remote from human influence, on the frontier of another world, an alien world, a world tenanted by willows only and the souls of willows.
and we, in our rashness, had dared to invade it, even to make use of it. Something more than the power of its mystery stirred in me as I lay on the sand, feet to fire, and peered up through the leaves at the stars. For the last time I rose to get firewood. When this is burnt up, I said firmly, I shall turn in. And my companion watched me lazily as I moved off into the surrounding shadows. For an unimaginative man, I thought he seemed unusually receptive that night, unusually open to suggestion of things other than sensory. He too was touched by the beauty and loneliness of the place. I was not altogether pleased, I remember, to recognize this slight change in him. And instead of immediately collecting sticks, I made my way to the far point of the island where the moonlight on plain and river could be seen to better advantage. The desire to be alone had come suddenly upon me. My former dread returned in force. There was a vague feeling in me I wished to face and probe to the bottom. When I reached the point of sand jutting out among the waves, the spell of the place descended upon me with a positive shock. No mere scenery could have produced such an effect. There was something more here, something to alarm. I gazed across the waste of wild waters. I watched the whispering willows. I heard the ceaseless beating of the tireless wind, and one and all, each in its own way, stirred in me this sensation of a strange distress. But the willows, especially, for ever they went on chattering and talking among themselves, laughing a little, shrilly crying out, sometimes sighing. But what it was they made so much to do about belonged to the secret life of the great plain they inhabited. And it was utterly alien to the world I knew, or to that of the wild yet kindly elements. They made me think of a host of beings from another plane of life, another evolution altogether, perhaps, all discussing a mystery known only to themselves. I watched them moving busily together, oddly shaking their big bushy heads, twirling their myriad leaves, even when there was no wind. They moved of their own will as though alive, and they touched by some incalculable method, my own keen sense of the horrible. There they stood in the moonlight, like a vast army surrounding our camp, shaking their innumerable silver spears defiantly, formed already for an attack. The psychology of places, for some imaginations at least, is very vivid, for the wanderer especially, camps have their note either of welcome or rejection. At first it may not always be apparent, because the busy preparations of tent and cooking prevent, but with the first pause, after supper usually, it comes and announces itself. And the note of this willow camp now became unmistakably plain to me. We were interlopers trespassers. We were not welcomed. The sense of unfamiliarity grew upon me as I stood there watching. We touched the frontier of a region where our presence was resented. For a night's lodging we might perhaps be tolerated, but for a prolonged and inquisitive stay, no. By all the gods of the trees and wilderness, no. We were the first human influences upon this island, and we were not wanted. The willows were against us. Strange thoughts like these, bizarre fancies, born I know not whence, found lodgment in my mind as I stood, listening. What, I thought, if, after all, these crouching willows proved to be alive? If suddenly they should rise up, like a swarm of living creatures, marshaled by the gods whose territory we had invaded, sweep towards us off the vast swamps, booming overhead in the night, 
and then settle down. As I looked, it was so easy to imagine they actually moved, crept nearer, retreated a little, huddled together in masses, hostile, waiting for the great wind that should finally start them a-running. I could have sworn their aspect changed a little, and their ranks deepened and pressed more closely together. The melancholy shrill cry of a nightbird sounded overhead, and suddenly I nearly lost my balance as the piece of bank I stood upon fell with a great splash into the river, undermined by the flood. I stepped back just in time and went on hunting for firewood again half laughing at the odd fancies that crowded so thickly into my mind and cast their spell upon me. I recalled the Swede's remark about moving on next day, and I was just thinking that I fully agreed with him. When I turned with a start and saw the subject of my thoughts standing immediately in front of me, he was quite close. The roar of the elements had covered his approach. Chapter 2 You've been gone so long, he shouted above the wind. I thought something must have happened to you. But there was that in his tone, and a certain look in his face as well, that conveyed to me more than his usual words. And in a flash, I understood the real reason for his coming. It was because the spell of the place had entered his soul too, and he did not like being alone. River, still rising, he cried, pointing to the flood in the moonlight, and the wind's simply awful. He always said the same things, but it was the cry for companionship that gave the real importance to his words. Lucky, I cried back, our tent's in the hollow. I think it'll hold all right. I added something about the difficulty of finding wood in order to explain my absence, but the wind caught my words and flung them across the river so that he did not hear, but just looked at me through the branches, nodding his head. Lucky if we get away without disaster, he shouted, or words to that effect. And I remember feeling half angry with him for putting the thought into words, for it was exactly what I felt myself. There was disaster impending somewhere, and the sense of presentiment lay unpleasantly upon me. We went back to the fire and made a final blaze, poking it up with our feet. We took a last look round, but for the wind, the heat would have been unpleasant. I put this thought into words, and I remember my friend's reply struck me oddly that he would rather have the heat, the ordinary July weather, than this diabolical wind. Everything was snug for the night, the canoe lying turned over beside the tent, with both yellow paddles beneath her, the provision sack hanging from a willow stem, and the washed-up dishes removed to a safe distance from the fire, all ready for the morning meal. We smothered the embers of the fire with sand, and then turned in. The flap of the tent door was up, and I saw the branches and the stars and the white moonlight, the shaking willows and the heavy buffetings of the wind against our taut little house were the last things I remembered as sleep came down and covered all with its soft and delicious forgetfulness. Suddenly I found myself lying awake, peering from my sandy mattress through the door of the tent. I looked at my watch pinned against the canvas and saw by the bright moonlight that it was past twelve o'clock, the threshold of a new day, and I had therefore slept a couple of hours. The Swede was asleep still beside me. The wind howled as before. Something plucked at my heart and made me feel afraid. There was a sense of disturbance in my immediate neighborhood. I sat up quickly and looked out. The trees were swaying violently to and fro as the gusts smote them. But our little bit of green canvas lay snugly safe in the hollow, for the wind passed over it without meeting enough resistance to make it vicious. 
The feeling of disquietude did not pass, however, and I crawled quietly out of the tent to see if our belongings were safe. I moved carefully so as not to waken my companion. A curious excitement was on me. I was halfway out, kneeling on all fours, when my eye first took in that the tops of the bushes opposite, with their moving tracery of leaves, made shapes against the sky. I sat back on my haunches and stared. It was incredible, surely, but there, opposite and slightly above me, were shapes of some indeterminate sort among the willows. And as the branches swayed in the wind, they seemed to group themselves about these shapes, forming a series of monstrous outlines that shifted rapidly beneath the moon. Close, about fifty feet in front of me, I saw these things. My first instinct was to waken my companion, that he too might see them. But something made me hesitate. A sudden realization, probably, that I should not welcome corroboration. And meanwhile, I crouched there, staring in amazement with smarting eyes. I was wide awake. I remember saying to myself that I was not dreaming. They first became properly visible, these huge figures, just within the tops of the bushes. Immense, bronze-colored, moving, and wholly independent of the swaying of the branches. I saw them plainly, and noted, now I came to examine them more calmly, that they were very much larger than human, and indeed, that something in their appearance proclaimed them to be not human at all. Certainly they were not merely the moving tracery of the branches against the moonlight, they shifted independently. They rose upwards in a continuous stream from earth to sky, vanishing utterly as soon as they reached the dark of the sky. They were interlaced one with another, making a great column, and I saw their limbs and huge bodies melting in and out of each other, forming this serpentine line that bent and swayed and twisted spirally with the contortions of the wind-tossed trees. They were nude, fluid shapes, passing up the bushes, within the leaves almost, rising up in a living column into the heavens. Their faces I never could see. Unceasingly they poured upwards, swaying in great bending curves with a hue of dull bronze upon their skins. I stared, trying to force every atom of vision from my eyes. For a long time I thought they must every moment disappear and resolve themselves into the movements of the branches and prove to be an optical illusion. I searched everywhere for a proof of reality, when all the while I understood quite well that the standard of reality had changed. For the longer I looked, the more certain I became that these figures were real and living, though perhaps not according to the standards that the camera and the biologist would insist upon. Far from feeling fear, I was possessed with a sense of awe and wonder, such as I have never known. I seemed to be gazing at the personified elemental forces of this haunted and primeval region. Our intrusion had stirred the powers of the place into activity. It was we who were the cause of the disturbance and my brain filled to bursting with stories and legends of the spirits and deities of places that had been acknowledged and worshipped by men in all ages of the world's history. But before I could arrive at any possible explanation, something impelled me to go farther out, and I crept forward on the sand and stood upright. I felt the ground still warm under my bare feet. The wind tore at my hair and face and the sound of the river burst upon my ears with a sudden roar. These things I knew were real, and proved that my senses were acting normally. Yet the figures still rose from earth to heaven, silent, majestically. 
in a great spiral of grace and strength that overwhelmed me at length with a genuine deep emotion of worship. I felt that I must fall down and worship, absolutely worship. Perhaps in another minute I might have done so, when a gust of wind swept against me with such force that it blew me sideways, and I nearly stumbled and fell. It seemed to shake the dream violently out of me. At least it gave me another point of view somehow. The figures still remained, still ascended into heaven from the heart of the night. But my reason at last began to assert itself. It must be a subjective experience, I argued. Nonetheless real for that, but still subjective. The moonlight and the branches combined to work out these pictures upon the mirror of my imagination, and for some reason I projected them outwards and made them appear objective. I knew this must be the case, of course. I took courage and began to move forward across the open patches of sand. By Jove, though, was it all hallucination? Was it merely subjective? Did not my reason argue in the old futile way from the little standard of the known? I only know that great column of figures ascended darkly into the sky for what seemed a very long period of time and with a very complete measure of reality as most men are accustomed to gauge reality. Then suddenly they were gone. And once they were gone, and the immediate wonder of their great presence had passed, fear came down upon me with a cold rush. The esoteric meaning of this lonely and haunted region suddenly flamed up within me, and I began to tremble dreadfully. I took a quick look round, a look of horror that came near to panic, calculating vainly ways of escape. And then, Realizing how helpless I was to achieve anything really effective, I crept back silently into the tent and lay down again upon my sandy mattress, first lowering the door curtain to shut out the sight of the willows in the moonlight, and then burying my head as deeply as possible beneath the blankets to deaden the sound of the terrifying wind. As though further to convince me that I had not been dreaming, I remember that it was a long time before I fell again into a troubled and restless sleep. And even then only the upper crust of me slept, and underneath there was something that never quite lost consciousness but lay alert and on the watch. But this second time I jumped up with a genuine start of terror. It was neither the wind nor the river that woke me, but the slow approach of something that caused the sleeping portion of me to grow smaller and smaller, until at last it vanished altogether, and I found myself sitting bolt upright, listening. Outside there was a sound of multitudinous little patterings. They had been coming, I was aware, for a long time, and in my sleep they had first become audible. I sat there nervously wide awake, as though I had not slept at all. It seemed to me that my breathing came with difficulty, and that there was a great weight upon the surface of my body. In spite of the hot night, I felt clammy with cold, and shivered. Something surely was pressing steadily against the sides of the tent, and weighing down upon it from above. Was it the body of the wind? Was this the pattering rain? The dripping of the leaves? The spray blown from the river by the wind and gathering in big drops? I thought quickly of a dozen things. Then suddenly, the explanation leaped into my mind. A bough from the poplar, the only large tree on the island, had fallen with the wind. Still half caught by the other branches, it would fall with the next gust and crush us, and meanwhile its leaves brushed and tapped upon the tight canvas surface of the tent. I raised a loose flap and rushed out, calling to the Swede to follow. But when I got out and stood upright, 
I saw that the tent was free. There was no hanging bough. There was no rain or spray. Nothing approached. A cold gray light filtered down through the bushes and lay on the faintly gleaming sand. Stars still crowded the sky directly overhead, and the wind howled magnificently, but the fire no longer gave out any glow, and I saw the east reddening in streaks through the trees. Several hours must have passed since I stood there before watching the ascending figures, and the memory of it now came back to me horribly, like an evil dream. Oh, how tired it made me feel, that ceaseless, raging wind. Yet though the deep lassitude of a sleepless night was on me, my nerves were tingling with the activity of an equally tireless apprehension, and all idea of repose was out of the question. The river I saw had risen further. Its thunder filled the air, and a fine spray made itself felt through my thin sleeping shirt. Yet nowhere did I discover the slightest evidence of anything to cause alarm. This deep, prolonged disturbance in my heart remained wholly unaccounted for. My companion had not stirred when I called him, and there was no need to waken him now. I looked about me carefully noting everything, the turned-over canoe, the yellow paddles, two of them, I'm certain, the provision sack, and the extra lantern hanging together from the tree, and, crowding everywhere about me, enveloping all the willows, those endless, shaking willows. A bird uttered its morning cry, and a string of duck passed with whirring flight overhead in the twilight. The sand whirled, dry and stinging, about my bare feet in the wind. I walked round the tent and then went out a little way into the bush, so that I could see across the river to the farther landscape, and the same profound yet indefinable emotion of distress seized upon me again, as I saw the interminable sea of bushes stretching to the horizon, looking ghostly and unreal in the wan light of dawn. I walked softly here and there, still puzzling over that odd sound of infinite pattering and of that pressure upon the tent that had wakened me. It must have been the wind, I reflected, the wind bearing upon the loose hot sand, driving the dry particles smartly against the taut canvas, the wind dropping heavily upon our fragile roof. Yet, all the time my nervousness and malaise increased appreciably. I crossed over to the farther shore and noted how the coastline had altered in the night and what masses of sand the river had torn away. I dipped my hands and feet into the cool current and bathed my forehead. Already there was a glow of sunrise in the sky and the exquisite freshness of coming day. On my way back, I passed purposely beneath the very bushes where I had seen the column of figures rising into the air. At midway among the clumps, I suddenly found myself overtaken by a sense of vast terror. From the shadows, a large figure went swiftly by. Someone passed me, as sure as ever man did. It was a great staggering blow from the wind that helped me forward again. And once out in the more open space, the sense of terror diminished strangely. The winds were about and walking, I remember saying to myself, for the winds often move like great presences under the trees. And altogether the fear that hovered about me was such an unknown and immense kind of fear so unlike anything I had ever felt before, that it woke a sense of awe and wonder in me that did much to counteract its worst effects. And when I reached a high point in the middle of the island from which I could see the wide stretch of river, crimson in the sunrise, the whole magical beauty of it all was so overpowering 
that a sort of wild yearning woke in me and almost brought a cry up into the throat. But this cry found no expression, for as my eyes wandered from the plain beyond to the island round me and noted our little tent half hidden among the willows, a dreadful discovery leaped out at me, compared to which my terror of the walking winds seemed as nothing at all, for a change, I thought, had somehow come about in the arrangement of the landscape. It was not that my point of vantage gave me a different view, but that an alteration had apparently been effected in the relation of the tent to the willows, and of the willows to the tent. Surely the bushes now crowded much closer, unnecessarily, unpleasantly close. They had moved nearer, creeping with silent feet over the shifting sands, drawing imperceptibly nearer by soft, unhurried movements. The willows had come closer during the night. But had the wind moved them, or had they moved of themselves? I recalled the sound of infinite small patterings and the pressure upon the tent and upon my own heart that caused me to wake in terror. I swayed for a moment in the wind like a tree, finding it hard to keep my upright position on the sandy hillock. There was a suggestion here of personal agency, of deliberate intention, of aggressive hostility, and it terrified me into a sort of rigidity. Then the reaction followed quickly. The idea was so bizarre, so absurd, that I felt inclined to laugh. But the laughter came no more readily than the cry, for the knowledge that my mind was so receptive to such dangerous imaginings brought the additional terror that it was through our minds and not through our physical bodies that the attack would come, and was coming. The wind buffeted me about, and very quickly it seemed, the sun came up over the horizon, for it was after four o'clock, and I must have stood on that little pinnacle of sand longer than I knew, afraid to come down to close quarters with the willows. I returned quietly, creepily, to the tent, first taking another exhaustive look round and, yes, I confess it, making a few measurements. I paced out on the warm sand the distances between the willows and the tent, making a note of the shortest distance particularly. I crawled stealthily into my blankets. My companion, to all appearances, still slept soundly, and I was glad that this was so. Provided my experiences were not corroborated, I could find strength somehow to deny them, perhaps. With the daylight I could persuade myself that it was all a subjective hallucination, a fantasy of the night, a projection of the excited imagination. Nothing further came in to disturb me, and I fell asleep almost at once, utterly exhausted, yet still in dread of hearing again that weird sound of multitudinous pattering, or of feeling the pressure upon my heart that had made it difficult to breathe. This is B.J. Harrison. I hope you've enjoyed this unabridged production of The Willows, Part 1 of 2, by Algernon Blackwood. If you have enjoyed this book, please visit our website at classictalesaudiobooks.com and sign up to be a financial supporter. Donate $5 a month and get a monthly coupon code for $8 off any audiobook. You'll be glad you did. Thank you for joining me today and allowing classic literature to awaken your better self. Please join me every week, and we'll rediscover the greatest stories ever put to paper.